Right. Welcome everyone to this information session on the Masters of Public Policies and Global Affairs at UBC. Uh, we're excited to get to chat with you about our program a little bit over the next hour. Uh, I'll just be quickly sharing the PowerPoint here uh, to walk you through some of the information more visually. Welcome to those of you tuning in from, from all over the world today. Uh, we're really excited to chat with you about our program. Uh, to begin, my name is Krista Knackley. I am the new program manager for the Masters of Public Policy and Global Affairs. Uh, and I'll be walking you through an overview of our program here at UBC. Uh, joining me, uh, I have a couple of folks who are going to also do be speaking to the program. So we have uh, George, George Hoberg, who is our academic program director. Uh, here at the MPPGA, and I'll be handing it over to him shortly to talk a little bit about our curriculum. Uh, and then we also have uh, Jemima here today, who is the president of our student association. So you'll be able to hear a little bit about a student perspective uh, later on as well. Thanks for that wave, Jemima. <laughs> uh, so we're joining you today um, from UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus. Uh, UBC Vancouver is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Hunkamenum speaking Musqueam nation. Uh, this land has been a place of learning for time and memorial, and we're really grateful to be having, uh, be able to host our program on this space, uh, and also in the beautiful and vibrant city of Vancouver. Uh, so not only is uh, the program a wonderful professional policy program, but it's also located in a really wonderful city uh, one of the most livable cities in the world, Vancouver, uh, as well as being situated at the University of British Columbia, which is a top research, innovation, and teaching institution in the world, uh, consistently ranked in the top 40 universities globally. Uh, and we're really excited about the opportunities that are available in this space, in this place, and through this program, and looking forward to sharing them with you a little bit today. Throughout the session, uh, please do feel free to ask questions in the Q&A function. Uh, we'll have folks looking at some of the questions we can answer throughout the session, and we'll also answer a few questions at the end. Uh, please do feel free to ask any questions that are lingering throughout, and we'll get to as many as we can. So who are we uh, at the Masters in Public Policy and Global Affairs? We are a full-time professional global public policy program, uh, which is delivered at the University of British Columbia as part of the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. The program uh, is really proud of our ability to provide policymakers and future leaders with multi multidisciplinary policy analysis and design skills alongside subject-specific expertise in development, sustainable, sustainability, and global governance. Uh, we have many different faculty members who are experts in their fields uh, and a really amazing opportunity to learn from policy experts. Our faculty, they're specifically actively engaged in their, with their communities on matters such as climate justice and climate action, Asian Pacific policy, indigenous rights, energy policy, democracy, and resource governance. Specifically, you'll be able to hear a little bit from, from George in a second, uh, and he's bringing a lot of expertise in, in that energy policy space uh, and some sustainability as well, and we're really excited to have him as our program director. And I'll pass it to George to talk a little bit more about our curriculum at the MPPGA. Thank you very much, Krista. And uh, it's great to be here with everybody. Uh, I hope to meet a lot of you soon. What the graduate program director is, that's my title, is that I am the, I guess the, the professor, the person who is an academic at the institution who is, ha, has overall responsibility for the delivery and management of the graduate program. And I'm just gonna go through a, just a very high level overview of how our program works. It's a, a two-year program, uh, generally. Uh, there, there's an option for a, a slightly shorter version. So that's uh, uh, the first year, a summer, and then two terms of the second year. So technically, it's about 16 months. In the first year, students take a number of core courses that focus on building basic skills needed to succeed in public policy. And just a couple of examples of those skills we're developing is policy communication, where you uh, learn to write an effective policy brief and clearly communicate policy decisions 
and analysis across a variety of communication platforms. We wanna develop a comprehensive knowledge of research methods, data analysis and ethics behind research data collection and policy analysis. And finally, an understanding of how policy processes work in both Canada and internationally, as well as the ability to analyze and evaluate policies. That latter one, the number three, is what I'm doing right now in the core course that I teach called PPGA 505 Global and Domestic Policy Processes. It's a lot of fun to teach. Uh, students really seem to enjoy it. So that's the first year. And in the second year, uh, students get to choose uh, five courses from a series of streams I'll talk about in a second, um, as well as a applied policy project that I'll turn it back over to Chris to talk about in a couple of minutes, uh, referred to as the Global Policy Project. So next slide, please. So the second year of the program is organized around uh, three streams that we use to package substantively similar uh, sets of courses. Uh, the first stream is called Development and Social Change. Uh, it focuses on things like development policy and uh, related issues. Uh, the stream that I focus on the most is the Resources, Energy, and Sustainability stream. We have specializations there in um, fisheries, food, uh, climate policy, energy policy, uh, and other aspects like that. And then finally, global governance and security, uh, which is a very rich uh, domain as well, where we look at a number of international institutions and issues. We don't really um, insist that everyone pick necessarily one of those streams. If they don't work for you, there is also an option to design your own stream. All you need to do is make a coherent case for doing so and explain that to the graduate program director, that would be me, and, uh, and you get my approval for that. Okay, next slide, please. So there are actually uh, two options uh, for the course, the standard option for the program. The standard option, uh, as I mentioned before, it takes 16 months. And I'm sorry, it takes 20 months. I, I should uh, get this all correct. That's the one on, on the top row there. Uh, what it, it makes it different from the accelerated option of 16 months is that it, it in, includes a co-op term. Normally, that co-op term is between your first and second year but it doesn't necessarily have to be. You could take your co-op term in the first term or second term of, uh, of your second year. Um, you just have to make sure you leave enough space in doing so to also be able to take our, uh, our, our capstone course, the Global Policy Project. It's also important to realize that that accelerated option, if it's something of interest to you, is only available to those people who have significant professional experience, which we define as five years of professional experience. Okay, so that's a very high level overview of the program. We're happy to answer any questions about that when we get to the question period, uh, but I'll turn things back over to Krista for now. Great, thank you, George. So as a professional policy program, uh, it's really important to us that you get applied experience in public policy. And one of the ways that we ensure that this happens is through our global policy project. So through our GP squared programming. Uh, so GP squared is a six credit course where students have the ability to work with clients to address current policy ch challenges. Uh, so students go through the process of creating a project proposal uh, that outlines the assumptions, problem definition, research design, fieldwork, and deliverables of a policy project. They conduct field research, working with a variety of stakeholders to collect data. Uh, historically, that's involved uh, some in some in-person field research, but also some virtual field research, depending on the global climate and our availability to travel. Uh, there's the ability to analyze the available information to provide a deliverable tailored to your client's needs. So you're working directly with that client to meet the needs that they're looking for such as a policy action report with action-oriented recommendations. So things that could actually be implemented by that partner. And then you present your findings at the end of the year at the PGA uh, symposium to your clients, colleagues, and other stakeholders. So an ability to get some real practical experience in uh, global public policy while working hands-on with a different community partner or non-governmental organization. Non -governmental or governmental organization. 
You can see some examples on the slide right now of some of our past projects, uh, both local and global in, in location, uh, and covering a whole bunch of different range of, of topics and interests, uh, both for you and for your partner. So a really great opportunity to get that applied experience while also being embedded in your course. Uh, so this is something that every student will, will embark on uh, throughout their degree. So we've been kind of outlining the major components of the MPPGA degree, but sometimes it can be most useful to hear from a student's perspective. Uh, so I had a couple questions that I was going to, to pass to you, Jemima, to see if, if you could kind of enlighten us on your experience so far at the MPPGA. Yeah, for sure. So the first one to start us off is just, if you could tell us a little bit about why you decided to do your MPPGA degree. Well, the reason why I decided to do that was because I was looking for a career change. Um, before that, I was a communications coordinator at the University of Calgary. And um, I knew that there was more that I wanted to add, especially in terms of value to my community. Um, and also public policy was an area that I'd encountered too many times within my line of work, especially because I um, did volunteering with the homeless um, shelter at, in Calgary. And uh, many of the homeless people that I spoke to um, spoke about bad policies. So that was where my um, interest picked. And also um, looking at um, the bilateral relations that um, Canada has with um, Asia, especially, um, especially with South Korea was an interest of mine. And that was one of the reasons why I decided to um, go with UBC because it's the, um, the Asian gateway, um, especially. And yeah, and that's why I'm here. Great, thank you so much. And then we had just finished talking about the GP squared projects, the global policy projects. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how the GP squared experience has been for you so far, uh, knowing you're in your first term of that project, and maybe mm -hmm. tell me about what excites you about the project you're working on. Well, I was very lucky to have gotten into the project, the first um, choice of mine, um, which is um, IOM Mongolia. And that has been great so far. And what we're looking at is looking at the Mongolian diaspora here in North America and how we can create a dias um, diaspora engagement strategy for the Mongolian government with IOM facilitating um, this approach. And it's very exciting because um, you are dealing, I'm a migrant to Canada myself. So um, just being able to apply my own experiences and also um, look at how um, diasporas work, like their networks work within um, North America. And also we're solving a problem, um, especially, you know, we've all are living through um, COVID and the government is, is looking at different opportunities to sort of engage their diaspora um, in terms of like knowledge transfer, foreign direct investment. As some of you might know, um, uh, Mongolia is a landlocked country, um, used to be formerly Soviet Union, and now they're, you know, it's a democratic country. And um, just um, being able to look at best practices from the world, especially Nigeria, which has a huge diaspora engagement strategy. And we have, I have team members from India, from Ghana, um, and so that is, it, it's great to be able to have our, talk about our different experiences and the knowledge and, and background that we bring towards the project. I think that has been fun so far, is working within a smaller team of, of classmates that I've done a year with um, to sort of like tackle a strategy that would mimics what we would encounter in the workplace. So that is what excites me the most, is the learning of new tools. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I have quite a few more questions for you coming up, but that we're going to move to the next slide for a second. And we'll get back to you uh, after that. So thank you for sharing your experience, Jemima. Um, I, as well, you can go to, you can view the, the catalog of GP squared projects on our website. Um, so Hui, if you don't mind putting that link in the chat, if you haven't already, it'd be a great opportunity to see what projects have been done in the past, the global reach and some of the nuances uh, like Jemima mentioned, there's so many different complex policy challenges that are kind of overlapping in a lot of the projects. So really great opportunity to get that experience. And 
GP squared is one of the ways that we make sure to center professional development into the MPPGA program. Uh, there's course, we've made sure that it's woven into the curriculum and into the coursework of all of our, all of our courses uh, through things like GP squared, but also additional courses that'll help with your practice uh, and your professionalism as a public policy practitioner. Uh, and additionally, there are many different uh, co-curricular, so opt-in opportunities to get additional professional development through workshops, through many different events, both run by the MPPGA, but also the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs more broadly, uh, through mentorship, both with uh, the opportunity to engage in mentorship with senior students, but also with uh, faculty members at the MPPGA uh, and with uh, professionals in the field. Uh, so we're looking at what that type of mentorship programming looks like to make sure that students are getting an opportunity to network throughout their degree. We also have a lot of career advising, uh, as well as conferences and case competitions that allow you to kind of really round out your experience and test out uh, different professional competencies throughout your degree. And one of the ways that that uh, can happen as well is through our co-op program. Uh, so we do have an upcoming info session that'll specifically center around career and co-op. Uh, but to give you a quick idea, um, MPPA, just, MPPGA students have the opportunity to participate in co-op, about a third of our students to half of our students do so every year. Uh, and that is the opportunity to have, to have an internship that provides paid and relevant work experience. Uh, in the policy profession. Students are usually taking their co-op term uh, between the summer of their first and second year in the MPGA program, and it allows students to uh, hone their professional skills and experience, to network with important change makers in public policy, and at times the opportunity to bridge into a job after graduation and build networks they can, they can move into after. MPPGA students have participated in many different types of, of co-op opportunities, some of which you'll see listed in the slides right now, uh, with Global Affairs Canada, with Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs, uh, the BC Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, the City of Richmond and Hemera, which is a, a sustainability consulting company out of Lower Mainland. Um, so there's a lot of really great opportunities, both with government uh, and with non-governmental groups. Uh, and some of those position titles included junior policy analyst, information management analyst, negotiation assistant, and research coordinator. So a great opportunity to get uh, tangible experience on your resume that can help build you into a professional role uh, after your graduation. There are also many opportunities to, to build your resume and to gain tangible experience through things like work learn and research assistantships uh, through the summer as well. And some of you might be coming with substantial professional experience. Uh, so you'll be able to learn more about some of the nuances of the opportunities that we help you locate uh, at that later info session on, on careers and co-op specifically. So um, with all of this, uh, all of these opportunities for professional development, there's definitely a lot to choose from. And often it's more about finding the ones that fit how you're trying to develop yourself as a global policy practitioner. And with that, I am going to, I have a couple more questions for Dr. Jemima uh, about specifically your experience in this. So um, Jemima, how do you think so far you've developed as a professional in your degree? Well, thanks, Krista. That's a really great question. I would say that I've developed um, a lot um, with the MPPGA program. Coming into the program, I think, I was very nervous about um, what that would look like um, if I was even qualified, even though I had gotten admission into the program. Um, because I, even though I had um, experience as a communications coordinator, I still didn't have enough experience within the policy field. So it's been great because the classes, like George had mentioned, um, they really do teach you the tools of how to write a, a very effective policy brief, how to do research within your first year. So those are tools that you sort of learn in class that would help you to even function as a professional um, within your, while you're doing your co-op or your um, internship. Um, luckily for me, and one of the greatest goal, I, I forgot to mention this of why I applied um, to the program was also because of the um, partnership that the program has with the United Nations Association of Canada. 
So that was one of the things that I was also gearing for was because I wanted to get an intern, um, an internship with the UN. And um, luckily I got selected among the um, small um, court members that um, got into the UN. I work um, at the moment for United Nations Development Program in Cambodia. Um, I mean, in, in, I'm in Vancouver currently, and because of COVID, we have to do this remotely, but I've been able to apply some of the tools from, um, from classes to the work that I do, especially in terms of research. Um, my role at the moment is um, a communications um, a, um, intern at, at the organization. So um, yes, it's based on, on communication and not so much policy, but I do edit a lot of policy briefs. Um, I'm on policy meetings and I've gotten the opportunity to work with a lot of um, different teams within the organization, especially monitoring and evaluation teams, um, the economic team. So it's, it's really helped me to become a well-rounded professional. And I would say the fear that I had initially upon entering the program isn't as there anymore because I feel like I have the tools to be able to compete with my colleagues and also with others um, in, in the policy field. And I look forward to um, even honing those skills, um, especially when um, we are right now doing the GP squared project. Um, you're basically also utilizing the same type of skills because you're dealing with a real life client who have real life issues. Um, so, and, and it's, it's great too, because you're not doing that alone. You have professors, um, a supervisor that is with you and that you could always piggyback with questions. Um, so I would say that um, I've learned a lot also from my peers. Um, many of them come with various diverse um, backgrounds and experiences and many of them went on to work at these um, places that Krista just mentioned and that was really great because we can share experiences, um, we can share best practices with um, one another and also like you know, learn from each other. And, and that has been one of my greatest um, experiences at MPPGA. Great, thanks, Jemima. Uh, it's interesting, I think one of the greatest strengths of this program is the diversity of the student body, both in experience, mm -hmm. uh, lived experience and professional experience. And also that feeds into what you're saying earlier about starting and not being sure if you fit, because there is no one mold of a student mm -hmm. uh, that we're looking for. So thanks for sharing. Um, do you feel like the professional development experiences you've had so far have shaped uh, your career goals and kind of the nuance of what you think you want to do after graduation? Yes. Um, so initially, um, I had mentioned that the reason why I applied was also to look at um, bilateral relations that Canada has with um, Asia, especially South Korea. I would say that um, based on the different um, papers that I've written and the projects that we've done, I'm sort of like looking more at international organization and also the fact that I got in with the UN. And um, I would say that it shaped that, that I entered um, with, the, with the third stream in mind. So that is global governance and security. I think I'm leaning more towards development and social change at the moment and even looking within um, so there was, there's a new program that just opened up with the African Union and UNDP. Um, so that is something that I'm gearing towards and hoping that I'll be able to get um, in after school start, um, after the end of school, sorry. Um, so like, I would say that that has shaped my goals because um, in your second year, you have the opportunity to choose many courses and sort of like, um, define what your stream would look like. And, uh, and based on the interactions with professors and the opportunity to take um, some courses over the summer, I've, that is starting to change. Um, yes, I still have um, interest within the bilateral relations, that, like, like I said earlier, but I would say that it's, more, it's morphed more into like development and social change. So that could always change for you guys. And if you don't know what stream you're going into, that is definitely okay. Um, you can figure out that in your second year after speaking with George, of course. <laughs> Great, thanks Jemima. I do have a couple more questions for you in a second, but mm -hmm. go back to the slides, slides for a minute. Um, and I'm noticing a lot of folks asking a lot of questions, which is really amazing. Uh, make sure to be asking some of those questions in the Q&A box as well, uh, so we can make sure we we're marking as we get to them there. So through all of this professional experience and, and like Jemima had, had noted all of the different ways that you can navigate and find the experience that you're looking for, uh, we do have a lot of, a lot of stories from our, our alumni. 
So if you do want to, if you did want to check out some of the uh, highlights and stories from past MPPGA students, you could go to um, the website listed on the slides here, which is sppga.ubc.ca news. Uh, and then there's an ability to filter for alumni stories. Uh, so you can see what some of our alumni have been up to and hear some of the stories of their own experience and how that has linked to their, um, to their careers after MPPGA. Uh, we also do have an upcoming info session that will allow you to hear more from alumni and their experiences. Uh, but our alumni have gone on to do many really important, exciting roles, um, some of which are listed on the screen right now. Uh, so lots of folks working uh, in policy analysis, uh, both locally uh, or both nationally in Canada, uh, but also globally. Uh, really great opportunities to uh, be networking with that, that group of alumni as well uh, and be, be part of a community of alumni of the MPPGA program. So before I kind of pivot into uh, some of the more nuanced things about our application requirements uh, and then uh, open it up to question and answer, uh, I did have a final two questions for you, Jemima. We're just going back and forth a little bit. Um, so the first one is, uh, I know that you're you know, starting out your second year now, so there's still some time to, time to go. Um, but can you tell us a little bit, what's been your overall experience with the MPPGA? Um, maybe what have been the highlights versus what has been really challenging for you? Um, I'm going to also talk about the benefit of networking with the alumni. And I think right. that that is one of the biggest value that I had. So this was my game plan when I first started my MPPGA was that I was going to network with at least five alumni um, from the program. And so I went on LinkedIn, messaged a couple of them, had informational interviews for, um, with them. And they, some of them have become really great friends and they've offered mentorship through that, especially like as, when it comes to like applying for jobs, like sending your resumes to them to help you vet it. Um, so that it's it's industry standard in a sense. Yes, um, we do have an awesome um, coordinator in the school. Her name is Gary Ross. If you can um, see her and get to her and book appointments, she's amazing for that. She's definitely made an, a huge impact in my life. But um, alumni were also great in the sense that many of them still work um, within the policy field and they usually get the first scoop to jobs and internships. And that actually came in handy um, this summer where um, there was an internal recruitment for an intern with one of the alumni that I was in contact with. And she sent it to me and it was an amazing um, opportunity. The only thing that, um, I would say was a barrier for me um, in getting the job, even though they wanted to go with me, was the fact that I didn't speak French. Um, so, but, but still, that was that is an opportunity that can come from ne um, networking with alumni. So, I would say that that has been a value for me. And and another value would be um, the wealth and depth of experiences and knowledge of the professors that teach the courses. Um, George is, is one, um, he actually just wrote a book um, as well. So he he's well um, networked within the, the policy field and he has a lot of experiences. Um, and you get to meet um, different professors that are um, have different interest areas. At the moment, I am a teaching assistant for um, Sarah Schneiderman and she has um, a lot of experiences within like the disruptions and earthquakes in um, Nepal. So I've been able to learn from that too, even though it wasn't something that I would have gotten into regardless, but just being able to um, learn from her and get that mentorship has been very valuable. And um, I would say the staff as well, like, you know, um, Krista has been a great help in getting, um, especially if you're stuck with like, I've been stuff. Um, I've had to rely on her for um, the student association as well. And I mentioned Carrie earlier. Um, just being able to have the staff support you um, with whatever. And if you're an international student, if you need a, um, an acceptance letter or that you're enrolled, um, whatever it is, um, the staff is always there to, to guide you and to offer um, whatever wisdom that they have. So I would say that those are like some of the greatest value. I don't know if you asked another question, but yeah. 
Oh, my, my kind of was a two part question. So that was my fault. Okay. The second part of that was more about like, what do you think is most challenging about this program or what's, what's the hardest part about being an MPGA student? Hmm. How real do you want me to get? <laughs> um, the challenge, uh, I would say uh, that I've actually um, experienced myself, and I think this is also individual um, because i had been a coordinator, a professional for a, a long time before coming back to school. I would say is um, at first getting in tune with the amount of courses that we were doing and also like the expectations of a master's program. It's nothing like your undergrad. Um, so it's the amount of work you have to put in and it's expected to because, you know, this is a, a you had to compete with a lot of students to get into the program. And also in order to be to get you ready for your professional career, you also have to um, gain these new skills and that could only happen through the courses we take. Um, I would think that um, time management was something I thought I had a handle on until I came to um, MPPG and I was, I was, you know, taught about it more. Um, I would say that has been a challenge. Um, and for me also is the fact, and I would say many of my core members was the fact that we did it online. So the lack of interaction, um, in, you know, physical interaction was something that was felt a lot, especially when you had to collaborate um, on assignments or like getting projects done. But that has been solved now because we're back in school. Um, but so far, I would say that that was a challenge of mine was knowing how to be disciplined enough to give appropriate attention to my courses and also um, not lagging behind and, and getting good grades at the end of the day, because that was my own goal for, for myself. So, yeah. Thanks, Jemima. Uh, some of those unique experiences, because MPPGA is an in-person program, but last year's cohort, mm -hmm. like you you had illustrated, had to jump into it online. Um, mm -hmm. I can speak for the program and say, we're very excited to have you all back in person now. For yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. knowing that we have a group of folks here who might be interested in applying for the program and we're about to walk through some of that application process, um, what's one piece of advice you'd pass along to someone interested in the program? Um, do your research. Uh, what type of um, policy field sector do you, you want to get into? Um, definitely learn about the SDG goals of the UN. Um, that would really help you a lot, especially when you're writing your uh, letter of interest. Um, and I would say that, you know, don't be scared. Take the punch. Um, put yourself out there. You never know. Like, I, I didn't think I was going to get into the program because, again, like I said, I didn't think I was qualified. But, you know, I surprised myself. And I'm here and also working for the UN, which was something that in my wildest dreams I would never have thought. So, um, take you guys are here. You've, you've already started that process by coming to an info session. Um, the program is amazing. You learn a lot from the professors, you learn a lot from your peers, from your colleagues, and it goes by really fast. I mean, like only what, a year ago, I was starting my first year and now I'm in my second year. And I would say that don't, don't be afraid and just take the plunge, do your research and um, prepare yourself to work really hard because yeah, you will need that. Great, thank you so much. And then Jemima, if you don't mind sticking around for some of the Q&A and so in case some of the questions really pertain to your experience, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you so much. So next, um, a little bit about some of that admission process. So I'm gonna return back to some of the slides. Hopefully you've gotten a taste of what the program is like uh, and some of the ins and outs of the type of support and experiences that are provided. Uh, so now you might be thinking, okay, well, how do I look at applications? So applications are currently open for the cohort that'll be starting in September, 2022. Uh, that, those applications are open until January 20th, uh, 2022. So who is the students we're kind of looking for? Uh, so folks do have to have an equivalent of a four-year bachelor's degree to apply for the MPPGA and a minimum GPA of 76%. Uh, that is based on um, the Canadian standards. So if you're coming from a, from a institution that has different uh, 
grade weighting, that is, we do have a way for calculating that for your application. So if you're curious about that, feel free to get in touch with the program. Uh, we also do require uh, certain levels of English language test scores uh, that are listed there on the screen as well. Folks are coming from all different academic backgrounds. Uh, so you can see on that, that maybe slightly blurry bar graph uh, that's on the slide that lots of people are coming from, from very different backgrounds and experiences. Uh, and that's what really makes the program so rich is the, the diversity of our cohort. Uh, we do um, the ability to have a couple years professional experience under your belt does help enhance your experience in the program Though we have had folks uh, apply straight out of their undergraduate degrees, uh, as well as have folks apply with substantially more professional experience who are just looking to add an academic lens or make a bit of a career pivot as Jemima mentioned earlier. Um, so if you wanted to know a little bit more information about our application process, uh, we do have a lot of information on our website. So if you go to uh, the link listed there on the slides, um, it walks you through step by step the, the process of applying. There is a handy video on there that walks you through the step of steps of application. Uh, but in general, before you start your online application, the components that you're going to have to be ready uh, to bring with you into that application are three letters of recommendation um, for, or three references for willing to give you letters of, letters of recommendation, official copies of your transcripts for all post-secondary institutions you have attended. If you're currently a UBC student, that would include letting us know your student number, um, and then a copy of your most current CV or resume so we can look a little bit more at that professional experience. Our application does involve um, some essay type questions uh, that Jemima kind of alluded to earlier by when she mentioned the SDG goals as well. Uh, so the ability to talk to us about why you're interested in specifically an MPGA degree uh, and for us to learn a little bit more about um, what specific uh, direction you're hoping to take your, your experience while you're here with us. Before I, I move quickly to the, the question period, I know we do have some questions um, that we still need to answer that are in the Q&A function. Um, George, is there anything that you wanted to add to the overview of the degree that we've provided so far that I might have missed? No, I'm good. Great. Okay, um, we will move then. We've got some time for question and answer. Um, so I'm just looking at the questions right now. Um, we have a question for you, Jemima. Uh, in your experience, what characteristics, skills, and personalities suit a career and work with policy? Or do you see most in your peers? Um, being assertive, being confident, and um, coming prepared. I would say those are the three um, traits that you should have. Um, especially when we are showing up with um, to client meetings, um, sending an agenda before time, um, coming with prepared questions. That shows that you're a professional, you've done the work, you're not just there wasting their time because these are people who are working and are very busy. Um, and being confident. Um, there are times that your peers will challenge you on a specific um, policy or why you um, think it should go this certain way. But um, sticking to what you believe in and being able to um, make a good argument is, is something that you should have as a um, professional. And um, being assertive is, is something that is really good as well, especially when you're applying for those jobs and um, going for interviews, um, knowing how to um, own your ground is great. And I'll be like, um, patience also comes in handy as well. Um, being patient with yourself when you don't understand the concept. Um, I mean, for myself, um, I didn't have any prior knowledge of statistics or, or economics, didn't take that in university. Um, so I came into the program, you know, starting from scratch and it eventually worked out. I didn't fill those two courses, so you would not fail as well. Um, it, the, the program is built to make you succeed in, at, at every step of the way. So you don't need to be worried about that. And I would say that being patient with myself and allowing myself to, you know, make mistakes and learn and go to the professor's office hour and talking to him about it really helped me as well. So, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. 
Um, the next question, I think I might direct at you, George. Uh, so students asking a question about what, are the, what do you see as the major differences between the UBC MPGA degree and the UBC political science degree? Uh, yes, I was just typing in an answer to that. <laughs> Am I actually supposed to answer questions verbally too? I'm, I'm happy to. <laughs> I actually know the political science department quite well because I'm a political scientist by training and spent my first 14 years at UBC in the political science department. Uh, the big difference is uh, that um, our program is course-based. Uh, the political science program, whether you're doing a master's degree or a PhD, has a, a, it's a thesis component. Um, we don't have a thesis. We have the global policy project. Um, and uh, it, our program is explicitly less theoretical and more applied uh, and designed to uh, build a set of very practical uh, policy making and policy analysis skills that's different from what political science does. Hope that helps. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm looking through the apologies, folks, I'm looking through the questions and seeing Huey answering a lot of the questions written as well. I'm trying not to double ask the questions. Um, one of the questions on here, uh, I actually don't have an answer to, but would be happy to follow up uh, via email. But George, I'm not sure if you know the average percentage of applicants admitted to the program. This will be my first admission cycle as program manager. Yeah, I don't know uh, what, what that number is. It would vary year by year. Um, I would say on average, I would say something like a third or a half, but I, to be honest, I, I don't really know, but, but we can, we can get that information back to people. Great. Yeah. Happy to follow up, follow up that information. I think your ability to clearly articulate your, uh, reasons why you want to go into global public policy, as well as how your professional, uh, and academic experience applies and the kind of nuance of what you're really looking to, to investigate. Uh, are going to all help your application um, as well. Yeah, if, if I can elaborate that a little bit, just in terms of what makes for good application. It's yeah. very important for us to be convinced that you can be successful in the program. And, uh, and so that, that involves doing reasonably well uh, in, in an undergraduate degree. It also helps your application if you have a policy-related professional experience. It's not required, uh, but, but, but it does uh, strengthen uh, the applications. Uh, we do ask you to write about uh, policy problems that you're interested in, and having those uh, answers be thoughtful uh, is, is also very important. So that the ability to think critically and write is something we, we look for uh, in the application. Great, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, looking through questions that haven't already been answered. If you go to the answer queue, uh, the answer uh, section, answered section as well in the Q&A, you'll notice some of the questions have been answered um, by way. Some of the details on what specific courses count for, for example, the uh, demonstrated knowledge in micro and macroeconomics, as well as the demonstrated knowledge in statistics is available on our website. So you can find that on our admissions website specifically. Uh, there's a question about references. Can we provide one academic reference or two professional and two professional references? So that is also listed on our application site uh, for folks with between one and um, one and five years professional experience. We do ask that you have two academic references in your application. One of those can be professional. If you are more than five years, if you do have more than five years professional experience, uh, that does go to ideally one academic reference and you're welcome to use two professional references. So it does kind of wait on, on how much professional experience you've accumulated. But we do want to hear some references uh, specifically from your academics. And thank you, Pai, for posting that link in the chat specifically about that. Um, there's a few questions specifically about the English language requirement, uh, specifically if that's required if you're applying from within Canada or within a country where your uh, instruction was done in English. Um, Hoi or George, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that does that only pertains to if your love, if your instruction, your previous degree was not in English, 
Uh, but if you have completed an undergraduate degree in the English language uh, taught in English, you would not need to submit your English test scores. Um, I see a question. Uh, try to keep your questions in the Q and A if possible. But I see one coming into Jemima in the chat, so I'll I'll direct that to Jemima. Uh, as someone who didn't take statistics and economics before. Um, uh, did you take any introductory courses at UBC before uh, jumping into the program, or how did you kind of catch up on that uh, on that knowledge? Yes, um, I don't know if you guys are um, doing that for this cohort, um, but we yeah. did have to take um, a pre-test um, before coming into the program. And what I did was go on Coursera. It's a website where they have like um, intros to macro, microeconomics, and statistics. So that was what I did was the summer before I started um, my program, I spent time in going through some of the concepts that I felt that we would be learning in class. Um, another thing that you could do as well is to um, get um, in touch with those who are, you know, the, in, the current first years and maybe get them to send you their syllabus of what they're learning. That is another way that you could also prepare um, ahead of time. But um, because UBC wasn't offering any um, courses um, in person, um, we had to do this online um, for ourselves. But I felt that um, the amount of work that I did in preparing myself initially before starting the program and those courses really helped me in um, not um, feeling too discouraged when I encountered some concepts because I'd learned about them previously. So I would say that um, it doesn't, it's not that difficult. It makes it much easier. Great, thanks Jemima. I think as well uh, to supplement that uh, Hui had put some information into the chat about how we kind of handle that pre, um, that demonstrated knowledge in stats as well as economics and how the different uh, ways that you can fulfill that requirement uh, if that was not an integral part of your undergraduate degree. Um, so one question that uh, came up was about creating your own stream or specialization. The question is, is there an opportunity for someone creating one geared towards uh, 2S LGBT, 2S LGBTQ plus or gender rights? I see above that there's no program specific courses. Uh, so George, I'm gonna start answering this, but might ask you to jump in after. Uh, so the ability to create your own stream often depends on the courses that are available. That being said, within courses, there's often an ability to select policy issues that you want to be working on and gear the inside content of your courses towards specific interests and policy uh, policy areas. But you'd also want to do your research into what uh, expertise exists within the faculty and whether or not there's courses available that would be enough credits to constitute an entire stream in a specific topic. But I know definitely the ability to focus on specific policy issues throughout your degree um, through your selection of assignments and readings uh, can definitely be be helpful. Um, George, is there anything you wanted to speak to on that? No, you're you're bang on with that. Good answer. Great. So yeah, for the for the official stream, you'd want to research what courses have been available previously, and that is available on the website, as well as look into uh, what faculty you're currently teaching in the in the program. Um, let's see. Uh, one question was about how do you determine who fits into the 16 month program as opposed to the 20 month program in regards to work experience? Um, George, again, I can start on this one, but um, my understanding is that that would be something that you would actually select into. So you would apply into the 16 month accelerated program if you met, meet the minimum five years of professional experience option, and that accelerated option does seem like something you want to conduct. Again, that would mean that uh, the accelerated option uh, means that some of those work terms or possibility for work terms are condensed. So that's kind of the trade-off there and why you'd want to be bringing a lot of experience, uh, but that would actually be something that you would apply into on your end rather than us sorting folks on the back end into the accelerated or the normal or the 20 month timeline. Um, George, anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, so that it's important to realize that the, the co-op that we have built into the program uh, is designed to make sure students get uh, professional work experience in public policy and global affairs. 
if a student already has that coming in, uh, we're less concerned about that, which is why we created the 16 month um, option for people who have had five years or more of uh, real world experience. And in that case, you don't need that same kind of uh, that professional development opportunity. And we're um, okay with you uh, getting through the program without that. Um, and then I noticed that there's a couple questions coming up uh, specifically about funding. Um, so some information on that can be found on our website. Uh, the entrance uh, awards for the MPPGA are merit-based, so they are uh, given out according, in accordance to your application, uh, so they're not a separate application to apply for. Um, we do not offer full fund, full ride scholarships for the MPPGA, um, but those scholarships are, are designed to be allocated based on merit. Um, George, is there anything you want to speak to on, on scholarships or the scale of them? Uh Nope, that's good. Can I add something to that, Krista? Of course. Um, so there's the Graduate Spring Awards um, that usually come up. Um, I think the deadline is in May or April. Um, it's a research award. Um, if, you were, if you have any research opportunities or interest, um, it's something that you could definitely apply for. And um, that um, is a huge, uh, substantially huge amount of money. Um, that would could go into um, your tuition and also the fact that you would have to um, carry out that research at the end of the uh, of your or within your program. So that is also something that you could um, go into. Um, I think we do send out information about that um, to students, incoming students, so that you would um, have all the information you need. But it's also found on the website as well. Great, thanks, Jemima. Yeah, it's a great example of there's some uh, scholarships and awards that are. Uh, distributed upon entry into the program, and there's some that are applied for when you're already in the program. Uh, so we do have some scholarships, like one Jemima has mentioned, that folks can apply for when they're a current student uh, and um, explore those as well. Uh, and thank you, Hui, for posting all of the relevant links in the chat. Uh, if folks are, we'll make sure that you have access to these links, we can also save the chat if you wanted to go back later and, and see some of these chats. Um, for a lot of the questions here, people, if you have a question that's, that's very um, specific to your circumstance, feel free to email us as well. Um, you can email us at mppga.program at ubc.ca uh, because things like scholarships and some of the grading requirements for specific courses will be really specific to, to your, your application. Um, is there any other questions, um, George or, or Tina Hawaii, that you see in the chat that we should be addressing? Uh, is there a chance to possibility to talk to program advisors in person? Uh, so you can definitely sign up to uh, chat with um, a program staff about more about the program uh, before you apply. Uh, I believe we're setting up a a Calendly link, uh, Hui, please correct me in the chat if that's not correct, uh, to sign up for short advising appointments for prospective students. Uh, so if you wanted to chat more about your specific circumstances, please do feel free to do so. We'll make sure you have access to that information as well. Uh, I highly encourage if you're looking to learn more about some of the nuances of this, uh, of the program, uh, to attend our future info sessions, to learn more about specifically some of the uh, career components of the program, uh, to hear from alumni. We also have a specific uh, info session coming up uh, on international students, for international students talking about funding. Um, and so that could be really, really helpful. Uh, additionally, signing up for the MPPGA newsletter can be one way to, to stay in touch with some of the information that's coming out here and have kind of a place where all of that is uh, condensed into one space. So I highly encourage you to do that if you are interested in the program. We're coming up to, to time here. So I didn't know, uh, George or Jemima, if there's any last words that you wanted to mention to all of our prospective students uh, who are interested in the program. Uh, I'll just say that uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you have, that you should uh, email the, the program email address, uh, mppga.program at ubc.ca. Uh, and if, if any of those things are academic questions that come to me, that they'll be uh, they'll be sent up to me. Uh, so 
Uh, it was really great to interact with all of you guys and we hope to see your applications soon and we hope to see you here in person soon. I was also gonna say that um, we're, we have a LinkedIn account as well. Um, if you wanted to con um, connect with those who are currently in the program or alumni as well, I'm also on LinkedIn. You can find me on there if you wanted to chat more about the program and expectations. But yeah, I'm looking forward to you guys applying. It's a great opportunity. It's definitely changed my life and my career prospects. Um, so um, yeah, do apply and we're looking forward to having you guys on campus. Great. Um, so we are coming just to time here. We want to make sure we honor the, the hour long time slot for, for this session. Um, so if any, if there was any questions that were missed, again, as George said, please do email us. Uh, we will get back to you with an answer to a question if you feel like it wasn't addressed here. Uh, but we're so grateful for all of you for coming and spending this hour with us and hearing a little bit about our program. We can't wait to get to learn a little bit more about you. Uh, and we hope to see you again at future info sessions uh, and hopefully as part of the MPGA 2022-2023 cohort next year. Yeah. Thank you all very much.